Hey everybody, it's Allison Harrell with the Fort Bend Museum and today we're talking all about cotton. So if you can't tell, cotton is a super weird plant and we're just gonna dive right into it and sort of start off with its family. Cotton is part of the Jossipium genus and it is part of the mallow family. First, we're gonna take a look at a few of their mallow family cousins. We're gonna consider them. So the first up is the okra plant. Um, if you thought cotton produced a really strange fruit, okra does as well. Um, okra is a very divisive vegetable. A lot of people have one specific way they like it cooked. Whether it be steamed, boiled, or fried, okra, um, you either love it or you hate it. Now another one of the cousins in the mallow family is the hibiscus plant. And when we go over um, the cotton life cycle in a little bit, you're going to see that a lot of the family resemblance really comes from the flowers. So the hibiscus flower has these giant open petals that really open the flower up very wide, and that's incredibly similar to the cotton flower itself. Now, the last cousin I'm going to mention today is also my favorite. It is the marshmallow. Now you might be wondering, marshmallow? That's a plant? Where does the marshmallow come from? So in Roman times, they would take the marshmallow plant, it is a plant that grows in marshes, and they would boil the roots and extract the sap, mix it with a little bit of sugar, and use it as a medicine to treat people that had sore throats. Now, over time, the amount of sugar added to this medicine increased significantly, and um, ingredients changed and shifted, and processes were invented, and eventually we ended up with the marshmallow that we know and love today. Now today the marshmallow is made with gelatin instead of the sap from the marshmallow plant. But in case you were wondering, the marshmallow is actually a little bit medicinal as well and it does sort of help when you have a sore throat. I'm not a doctor, that is not medical advice, but if your throat hurts, try marshmallow. Now that we know the other weird cousins in the family, let's talk about the cotton plant itself. But before we talk about the plant, let's talk about the history of it. So cotton was domesticated in three different places around the world all around the same time. So India, China, and the Americas, specifically Central and South America. Now, cotton is a tropical shrub, which means that it loves to grow in heat. And another great thing about cotton is that if you grow it, process it, weave it, make it into clothes, those clothes are also really great to wear in hot places. So cotton spread around quite a bit because it's lovely to wear in hot places and it's easy to grow there too. Sometime in the first century, cotton made its way to Egypt. Now, cotton thrives really nicely in Egypt. It is a very hot climate, cotton loves it, and it does really well. Now, today in the store, you can buy something called Egyptian cotton. I wanna take a moment to sort of point out that Egyptian cotton is not native to Egypt. What it is, is something called Pima cotton. And this is just a species of cotton that has a longer staple length than some. So most of the cotton we grow today in Texas specifically, um, like this cotton, has a very short staple length. It, every single fiber within this fluff is pretty short, between half an inch to two inches long. So Pima cotton just has a slightly longer staple length, which makes it a little bit easier to work with and makes sort of a more luxurious cloth at the end of it. So um, whenever you're buying Egyptian cotton, it doesn't necessarily mean it's from Egypt. It just means that the Egyptian name has been associated with it for marketing purposes. Um, so by 1516, people in Southern Africa were also growing and wearing cotton clothing. So it really spreads nicely through tropical areas in general. In the Americas, we also know that cotton moved about throughout the two continents pretty freely. So we have evidence that the Native American groups that live in what was now what is now the American Southwest were growing and wearing cotton pretty regularly. We also have existing examples of 7,000 year old clothing made from cotton that has been found in caves in Mexico. We know that the southern portion of the United States, all of Mexico, most of Central America, and on into South America all have the right climate for cotton to thrive. Most of Europe does not have a climate that would um, suit cotton, so cotton does not grow there, which means that cotton has always been a trade good to Europe. So when the first colonists made it to Jamestown, they actually had cotton with them as a cash crop. They were gonna grow it and they did, but it wasn't their main cash crop. It wasn't what they were immediately thinking of when they started the colony. Okay. So let's talk about the life cycle of the cotton plant itself. 
Now, I might have already mentioned this, cotton is a shrub. In the wild, it can grow up to 20 feet tall if you let it. It's a pretty big shrub. But um, domesticated cotton today typically grows between one to two feet. It's not massive when it's um, being looked after by people, but it can be if you let it. Okay, now it's time to start talking about the cotton plant life cycle itself. Now, the time in which you plant a seed varies because of where you are in the world. Climate can really affect how a plant grows, when it will grow, and when it will do its best. So, we're going to be talking about a range of months for planting, but also the length of time each stage of this life cycle takes. Now, most of the dates we're going to be talking about are specific to Texas. For the lower Rio Grande Valley area of Texas, planting season for cotton starts in February and March. Right when the weather starts to turn hot is right when you can start planting the seeds. But because Texas is so big and the climate across Texas varies so much, that um, planting season can extend all the way to June in the panhandle of Texas. So for planting cotton, your range really runs from February to June, which is five months of the year, depending on where you are in the state and when it starts getting hot. So after the seed is planted, the first thing that comes out of the ground is the little seedling. And the seedling, the first thing it does is it makes two symmetrical leaves. These are called true leaves. They also let you know that's the cotton plant. So it's a very distinctive leaf that you can look for if you happen to have a lot of weeds in the area. Part of the reason we're talking specifically about Texas when we talk about cotton production is because co Texas ranks number one in cotton production in the United States. Also, we live and work in Texas, that's where the Fort Bend Museum is, so of course that's the state we're going to talk about the most. Cotton is the leading cash crop in Texas and it is grown on over 5 million acres of land. Texas produces about 40% of the total cotton grown in the entire United States. So, fun facts. So it takes about 60 to 70 days for the plant to go from the seedling to the, those first two little leaves to its first flower. Now, the cotton flowers are very typical of the hibiscus or mallow family. They have those really broad petals that open really wide. So when you see the flower, you know that it's part of the mallow family, part related to the hibiscus, and it's a cotton flower. Now, the really neat thing about cotton flowers is that when they bloom, they're white. But when they're pollinated by bees, then they start to change color. So they change from pure white to sort of a yellow and then sort of a pale pink. And then eventually as they're closing, they turn into this deep magenta-y pink color. So the change in color lets you know that the flower has been pollinated and it's time for the bowl to form. So it takes between 50 and 70 days after the flower appears for the bowl to appear. Now, the bowl is a very interesting part of the cotton plant. When it first starts forming, it's a hard, closed, green, teardrop-shaped thing. Um, the analogy I usually use is it's very similar to a walnut. It's very hard and um, shell-like. Now, the bowl itself goes through a 15 to 20 day ripening period. And that's when it goes from that hard closed green bowl to this brown split open one. So inside the bowl is where the cotton fibers are growing. And once the bowl is fully ripe, it actually explodes open to show the fiber. But you can see the edges of the bowl right here. Now there's always leaves that stick around the bowl and sort of cup it. So um, you can see the leaves are still there even though this is a dried plant. You can see the little bowl parts here. Now, if you're thinking about it, this bowl and this fiber, this is the fruit of the plant. Cotton is a fruit. Now having said that, cotton is not a food. So just because it's the fruit doesn't make it a food the fruit refers to the part of the plant that seeds grow in. So it's within this fluff, and I have a little bit of extra fluff, and if you pull it apart, you can actually find the seeds. They look like this. They look like this, they're teardrop shaped, and um, they're, so because they're teardrop shaped, they do have a point on one end. They're brown, and they're covered in microscopic little hooks. Now, something really interesting about cotton is that not all cotton is white. So there are actually four different colors of cotton that grow naturally. White, brown, pink, and green. 
Now, um, you may wonder why have you never seen these or heard of these before, and it's really pretty simple. White cotton is the only one that's grown commercially. And that's because, remember that staple length I mentioned earlier, how long each fiber was? The length of the fiber makes it more commercially useful. And for this white cotton fiber, this staple length is about half an inch long, maybe a little bit longer. It's not super long. And considering that sheep's wool can get up to a 15 inch staple length and silk can get up to a mile long for a single fiber, half an inch is not that long. Now, the reason that we don't grow the other colors commercially is because their staple length is even smaller. So brown and green cotton, I think, are native to the Americas. I actually have some brown today. And the really neat thing about colored cotton specifically is that when you take white cotton and dye it and make something like a t-shirt, over time, as you wash that item of clothing, the color will start to fade. However, if you use a colored cotton like this brown or the green or the pink, over time as you wash it, the color will get darker. That five to six month growing period of cotton does come to an end in late summer and early fall in this part of Texas. Cotton is highly regulated by the government and that's because we don't want a pest called the boll weevil. We're gonna do an entire video on just the boll weevil, so look forward to that. Um, but what you need to know for now is that the boll weevil is a pest, we do not like them. And the way we keep them from coming to this area is by getting all of our cotton out of the field by a certain time. And that, that date does shift by region of Texas. If you noticed, um, planting in February and March in one area of Texas and June in another means that the um, picking date is sort of a sliding scale across the state. Now, um, I want to mention this right now. We're going to delve more in depth into it later, but picking cotton is kind of the worst. Now, today, they use giant tractors and machines that will just crunch the entire plant up, throw it in the back of the truck, and sort it out later, which actually means that humans picking cotton is the most efficient way to get cotton and only cotton out of the field. But it is a horrible process for people to do. So the cotton picking bag is between seven to eight foot long for children or smaller adults and up to 12 foot long um, for, that is the largest length bag that we've ever found. Now it goes across the shoulder and you wear it as you walk down the field. You don't pick it up, it drags behind you. And you are trying to pick only the fluff. So when you look at this, um, remember that bowl is underneath here. So you can see the tips of the bowl are actually relatively sharp. So you want to take your hand, go between the um, edges of the bowl, pluck out just the fluff, fill the bag with fluff, and you have to fill that bag every single day. It's the worst. <laughs> um, we are going to do an entire another video on the relationship between cotton and slavery. And um, so I want to mention that now and I wanna mention picking cotton now, but do know we are gonna delve farther into that in the future. So look for that coming up. So that is our lightning fast roundup of cotton and its life cycle. So I hope you learned something today. I hope you learned something new. As a fun last parting fact, I do want to leave you with this little bit of knowledge. So when I mentioned earlier that cotton is a fruit, but not a food, I neglected to mention that you might have actually already eaten part of the cotton plant. So um, one of the things you can do with cotton seeds, there are a few things you can do. You can plant them to make more cotton. You can feed them to your pigs because pigs eat just about anything. Or number three, you can actually crush them to make something called cotton seed oil. And cottonseed oil is actually used by Frito-Lay in order to make some of their chips. That's the oil that they fry their chips in because it is um, slightly healthier than certain other oils. So even though cotton is a fruit and you can't eat it, you might have already consumed a cottonseed inadvertently. So um, I hope you enjoyed our video on cotton and I hope to see you next time.